Um, when those videos are added. Additionally, this project will culminate in a report which will be ready towards the end of May that will bring together reflections from our conversations today. We'll, we will be having an open call, so please reach out if you'd like to submit your work to be included in it. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the COVID crisis in India right now. Many of our guests are joining us from there. In addition to my research partner, Divya, and we hope you and your loved ones are safe. South Asian student organizations across the US, including at the Harvard Business School, the Harvard Kennedy School, and South Asia, G Asia GSD have collaborated to set up a fundraiser for assisting relief work in India. A link will be added to the chat if you'd like to contribute. Our third and final pan panel discussion on reclaiming narrative rounds out all of the critical conversations we've had throughout the Reconfiguring History Symposium. The relationship between indigenous communities and museums is often complicated given the legacy of violent and inequitable treatment experienced in a historic and contemporary context. Similar to the loss of land experienced among indigenous people, a significant amount of human remains funerary items and material culture from respective commu indigenous communities were unjustly lost and accessed into museum collections. In this day and age, as our nation is encountered with issues related to socio-political inequities that bubble to the surface, derived from our nation's inability to reckon with its violent settler colonial origins. Artists play a fundamental role in promoting decolonial praxis among institutions. As such, the third panel features indigenous artists whose work encompasses the complexities of these issues in profound and powerful means of expression. Uh, to begin, I'd like to introduce our panelist, Jordan Porman Cocker, is an indigenous curator and artist from the Kiowa tribe and the kingdom, kingdom of Tonga. Her pronouns are she, her. Cocker holds a master's of museum and heritage practice from Victoria University in Wellington, as well as a bachelor of design from Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand. Cocker's curatorial practice focalize, focalizes indigenous ways of knowing and doing, linking relational worldviews to indigenous futurisms. She currently works with the Gilcrease Museum as a loose curatorial scholar of indigenous art, researching the museum's two-dimensional indigenous paintings collection. Our second panelist is Kara Romero. Kara Romero was born in Inglewood, California and raised between rural Chemehuevi Reservation in the Mojave Desert and the urban sprawl of Houston, Texas. Her identity informs her photography, which is a blend of fine art and editorial photography. Her practice is shaped by years of study and a visceral approach to representing indigenous and non-indigenous cultural memory, collective history and lived experiences from a native female perspective. And finally, before we begin, uh, we will have time for questions at the end of this panel. So please use the Q&A uh, chat function uh, to submit any thoughts or questions you may have and we'll address those at the end of the panel discussion. Without further ado, um, I invite Kara to begin your presentation. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, my name is Kara Romero. Uh, Mark Hagaruyu, Nu Kara Romero Niega, Nu. nu. Uh, I'm an enrolled member of the Chimwevi Indian tribe, and I'm so thankful to have been invited today by Heidi and Divya and the Native American program of Harvard University. I am calling in from um, Los Angeles, California, so the center of creation um, for many Southern California tribes and the ancestral homelands of the Tongva Gabrielino, um, as well as Ahashmim and Tatvium people of the greater Los Angeles area. 
Um, I would like to share my screen at this time and um, take the audience through uh, some of my work and hopefully address um, some of the themes of um, today's programming. So I was born in the 70s to interracial parents in Inglewood, California. And um, like many um, native artists and peoples carry um, those from whom I descend in my heart with me at all times, like a sacred bundle and walk through this life um, with the people that came before me, these being the very wonderful women um, from who I had the opportunity to grow up with in a very loving home. We moved to the reservation in 1979 um, which is located in the Mojave Desert of California. We are on the California side of uh, Havasu Lake, California, um, which was the Colorado River, um, and was uh, we were flooded out of our ancestral valley um, to make Havasu Lake. Um, going back a little bit, um, growing up uh, on the reservation, um, I was also um, born, like I said, to interracial parents and um, spent my life split between homes, um, like many kids from divorced families. So half of my life was in the suburbs of Houston, Texas, um, in a majority minority school district. Um, and then the other half of my life was with my dad's side of the family on the very rural Native American reservation out in California. And um, that a uh, kind of bicultural experience, um, both rural and urban, um, is something that definitely informs my artwork. Um, but I think it's an important story to tell because um, it's not that unique. I think many uh, Native people and artists have both an urban and rural experience. Um, and as we uh, work to counter um, stereotypes of Native peoples, it's important to understand that we have a lot of different stories and a lot of um, dynamic backgrounds from uh, which, where, where we emerge from. Um, so one of the things that I learned really early on in this um, kind of bicultural walking in two worlds experience was that most um, people in the mainstream cities that uh, I, I knew um, going to public school had very little understanding of modern um, Native American peoples, that we had been completely erased in um, both media and um, education. And so it was very exhausting growing up in the city, trying to explain what it was to be a modern Native American person. Um, and so I guess that planted a seed really early on that I always wanted to work on narrative. Um, and as I stepped into college, I went to school for cultural anthropology and native studies. And as fate would have it, um, ended up in a, a photography class my senior year at the University of Houston, never having picked up a camera and um, understood very early on, not only was I in love with the medium and really wanted to get better at it and had a really healthy compulsion um, towards um, wanting to get better at it, but I also understood very early that this was um, what I had wanted to do my whole life. What this was going to be the medium by which, you know, my photos would be worth a thousand words and being able to explain many stories. Um, for many of my friends and family to begin to um, counter everything being taught as bygone. And so that kind of um, just is a little bit of background about how I became to be a photographer. I started out in black and white film. And at that time in my life, I did what 20 year olds do. And I ran off to art school in Santa Fe. Um, which was um, a tremendous experience. And I became part of the family of the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, um, from which I uh, still live close by and um, love my family at I. So 
Uh, I'll go through the work pretty quickly. And um, I just think it's really important that as um, I have made the body of work, that has been truly what has informed me um, about the different themes that emerge in my work um, as far as speaking to different narratives, like what we're talking about today. Um, I think it's really important um, that for me, uh, my work often comes back to this idea of the cultural landscape. And I think for many Native peoples, um, the place from where our bones are from um, is really what ties us spiritually to our landscapes and to the people that came before us and to um, our indigenous sciences from where we're from and our intimate knowledge of our ecosystems and our traditional arts. And it's just... Um, part of the fiber of our beings, um, this idea of cultural landscape. So for me, um, one of the very important themes that have emerged are the cultural landscape from um, which I am from, which is the land of the Joshua trees, um, the land of the beautiful sunsets and the bird singers of Southern California, um, the cacti and the mythos of the desert um, that emerge in um, ways that our ancestors and our spirit beings are all around us in the landscape, um, intimately interdependent and connected to each other. Um, these are all ideas um, that have helped me stay true to my own story and true to my own belief systems, which of course are so different for so many of the tribes, but for a lot of us, um, we find similarities and universe, universal um, beliefs and these ideas of like original instructions and wisdoms that are passed down through thousands of years of um, being within our ecosystems. Of course, it's really important um, to also acknowledge the changes in our ecosystems and um, the effects of development and removal and um, the ways that settler colonials um, have affected how we're able to interact with our ecosystem. So um, as part of cultural landscape, not only addressing the things that are intact about our landscapes, um, but also about the things that have been destroyed and stolen and taken away. Um, always trying to um, reassert our place in the arc of American history um, and address those stories that have been uh, made invisible very purposely um, in uh, academia and as well as media. Um, ideas um, that emerge in my artwork um, in ways to uh, counter Native American stereotypes have really, um, for me, began to become more and more autobiographical um, as a way to, to stay true to story. Um, so kind of this idea that if I'm telling a story that's very true to myself and where I'm from and all of my experiences and my subconscious and all of the things that have formed me into this moment, um, that, that is a story that is worth telling. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about um, ideas coming from within the culture versus ideas um, placed on us uh, by um, photographers or documentarians from outside of the culture. I think it's, you know, a subtle, I don't even think it's a subtle shift. I think it's a very powerful shift um, to see um, imagery that's made um, from within the community. And I would say that uh, most Native people could look at any photograph side by side um, from within the culture versus from outside of the culture and know um, very immediately um, where that stands as far as um, truth and authenticity and depiction. So um, a few more pieces about the place that I'm from. Um, the beautiful Mojave Desert along the Colorado River, the children from within our community, this blend of 21st century ideas with really old ideas is um, definitely a theme that comes back for me that uh, um, emphasizes um, how it all exists as once. So how our indigeneity comes um, with us all through time and um, is here right with us in this modern context, our ideas that I'm really interested in 
communicating visually and kind of reinforcing um, this idea that we don't have to be exactly the way we were 200 years ago, but we can be every bit um, as proud of our indigeneity as um, it's changed through both changed through time and stayed the same. Um, this Jackrabbit and Cottontail series um, was part of the Desert X Biennial in 2019. Um, for me, this was a very important experience um, in the, the, the arch of my work because it was my first experience with public art and um, creating highly visible works um, that were taken out of institutional settings um, and were uh, accessible to everybody, um, accessible to everybody in their car, um, all um, socioeconomic classes, all races. Um, and so uh, it was a really wonderful experience to take an advertising space and advertise um, the things that you would want to see um, in these advertising spaces. Um, these were definitely a response to um, the landscape from an, a California indigenous perspective. So um, placing us in the cultural landscape, um, responding to um, uh, environmental racism and um, development on ancestral homelands, uh, whether that be gold in the Black Hills or hydroelectric energy or solar. Um, big energy often goes into the backyard of people of color. And while this piece celebrates, um, it's called Evolvers and celebrates um, this idea of embracing renewable energy, it's also meant to be a reminder um, that these landscapes are not empty and hold a rich history for native peoples. Um, protection of sacred sites and landscapes stories of humanity, response to political landscape. Um, again, this idea of um, using references to pop culture um, has something that's become really important to me um, because often uh, people photographing from outside of the culture um, want uh, a glimpse into our cultural privacy. And that has been something that's been um, profound for me. There's a couple other references um, later on with the last Indian market, which for me was an aha moment about um, how we can really turn um, the camera and communicate from within inside the culture that we're very astute in modern culture. Um, we know biblical stories, we know pop culture references. And so this idea of um, people from outside of the culture often wanting a glimpse into what I call our cultural privacy is for me wrong. And so as a native photographer, being able to find ways um, to constantly place us in modern context um, to give humanity and empowerment, um, as opposed to taking um, from our cultural privacy um, and it is, is, wrong, is conversely wrong. Um, ideas of um, climate change and impacts to our landscape through both um, historical flooding and flooding that has occurred through climate change um, are, are themes that I'm interested in telling the stories uh, about, um, stories that go unrecognized in um, our academic, uh, in our academic portrayals. And here again, um, this idea of our pop culture and indigeneity. Um, this piece is called um, TV Indians. And this one is really, um, it really holds a lot, I think, about the, the themes that we're talking about today. Um, so this was conceived of first as a kind of a, a postmodern response to Curtis. Um, so it's taken back to sepia tone and it's meant to be um, the, the statement on the figurative landscape um, that Curtis was known for and putting things in sepia tone. Um, but I definitely wanted to bring in a modern context and began to think of the ruins and the New Mexico landscape and 
um, thought about our consumerism and had this idea to stack um, TVs on um, a cliff top overlooking Galisteo Basin and um, placing my friends and family dressed in, in our uh, tribal Pueblo regalia in front of this landscape. And then we brought a generator out and turned on the TVs. So some of them are actually turned on. Um, and then in photo illustration, placing ways that we have been portrayed in the media. Um, so from left to right, there's uh, Billy Jack and Iron Eyes Cody, who was not native at all. Um, Little Big Man, Lone Ranger and Tonto, Smoke Signals, Thunder Heart. Um, there's the occupation of Alcatraz, the raising of the flag at Iwo Jima. And these um, images were selected by my husband and I, and the idea was um, they're very nuanced. So while they are um, definitely have, you know, some elements of being problematic and stereotypical, they also fall in the, this fine line of being somewhat beloved. And so as Native people, we can kind of sit with the piece and, you know, like we recognize these images right away and sit with this idea of, you know, why are these beloved? You know, is it because that's all we had? Um, and then this idea of the stark juxtaposition or the stark contrast of what we actual actually look like compared to how we're portrayed in the media. And so it kind of evokes this idea that I think uh, many of us are familiar with of living in two worlds, one of cultural privacy um, in an act of passive resistance, right? So facing, you know, hundreds of years of persecution and how do you stave off persecution? You stay culturally private. And so I call it passive resistance. And so what emerges as, you know, how we're portrayed in the media is um, something that's kind of laughable when you look at it or like from, from within inside of the culture. Um, I think it's just, quizzical for so many of us, how we've been portrayed in Hollywood, how we've been portrayed in textbooks as bygone. So this is um, certainly one of my all time um, favorite pieces. Um, for me, Last Indian Market was um, such an aha moment. And this truly was, um, you know, as becoming a mature photographer and understanding um, that the most important thing for me at this point in my career was that, um, the, that I learned that the best way to make art was to be absolutely true to myself. And that that can, while that can feel very vulnerable, that that's actually um, the very best thing that I could do as a contemporary um, Native woman is to be true to my own identity. And this piece was very pivotal for me, um, one, because it was the biggest production to date, but also um, because of the reception. Um, and I would, I would follow it up by saying, you know, my, my audience is not outside of the community. My audience are my native peers and the contemporaries that I admire so much. So when I'm putting work out there um, into the world, I think it's wonderful when it's received cross-culturally. But for me, the work is really meant to give back to my community um, in hopes that when they see themselves or their friends um, represented in a positive light that that uplifts the community in a way that they have not seen before. Um, and this piece kind of goes back again to that idea of, um, of, of placing us in, um, in the camera in a way where we're asserting how very modern we are and how um, we're fully astute in pop culture and biblical stories. And these ideas of how um, we bring our mythos um, through time with us. And then I would say finally, um, a theme um, I am definitely known for is um, uh, strong, strong women taking a central role. And um, that is something that uh, is important to me because of where I come from. Um, in Chimwebi, our creator is a woman. Um, and we have not only a great amount of gender equity in our community, but actually um, predominantly female governed. Um, and that 
uh, is not only historically, but even in the days of tribal council, we are female um, dominated. And so as Chimwevi women, we're taught from a very early age of our innate strength of our medicine. Um, we're never taught to be quiet or to not take up space, quite the opposite. And so these images really come through um, and I would say it's really important to understand that my pieces of Native women um, are giving agency to the woman herself, and each one is named after um, the woman um, portrayed in uh, the image. So this one is Ka, and this one is very much about Ka's story. Um, there is a lot of interview process. Um, from the very beginning, um, the inception of the work, there's drawings that go into it, there's um, um, consultation, um, all of the things that must be done as photographers, free prior and informed consent, um, privacy given to the person, um, as well as agency all the way to the end of the process and making sure um, that they feel good about putting this image out into the world and telling their story that we've um, collaborated on together. So these stories with the women I've portrayed are highly collaborative um, from a very maternal, from a very loving place. Um, and sometimes they bring in the whole family to create the pieces. Um, so they become intergenerational collaborative endeavors um, seeking to tell um, stories about each of the women um, in the photographs. And I am um, at time, so I'm just going to flip through these uh, as uh, we get ready for Jordan's presentation. And I think through these images, um, it kind of speaks to that idea that I was talking about, about the really powerful shift to have a Native woman behind the camera and how just the act of it being told from within the community by a woman becomes very maternal and counters these ideas of exploitation, um, objectification, exotification, um, all of these things that you just, I don't know how you might know if you're trying to tell stories from outside of the community. Um, we're held to uh, such strict cultural protocols that often as Native peoples were not um, out there as artists representing ourselves. Um, we are um, representing our communities and sometimes our entire nations. And so there's a lot of thoughtfulness um, that goes into um, putting work out into the world. And these next two are a little bit of sneak previews for our captive audience today on work that I'm working on here in the Southern California area. So thank you so much. And um, I appreciate being here. Deonde Barbon, Deonde Bats A, Dom Toya Koi Ma Kan, Toy Boga, Paddle Tika, Big Up Nido. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Jordan Ailea Porman Cocker. I am an enrolled member of the Kiowa tribe. My mother is Stats Ma, meaning praying women. And I come from the Paddleti and Toibo uh, families from the Redstone and Rainy Mountain regions of the Kiowa Comanche Apache Reservation in Oklahoma. My father is Geliki Koka and we're descendants of Fili Fakataha Tupo Fa. Our family are from Vava'u, Ha'apai, and Tongatapu in the kingdom of Tonga via Aotearoa, New Zealand for the past three generations. So I am a, an artist, a curator. I come from a long line of Kiowa artists and um, mainly use this art practice for uh, my family and community. I currently work with the Gilcrease Museum as a loose curatorial scholar of indigenous art. My research uh, with the Gilcrease focuses on the museum's 2D indigenous paintings collection. Uh, my framework utilizes territory, place-based, and a, lands, 
a land-based lens to more deeply examine the works of over 90 Indigenous artists with a focus on the trajectory of 2D Indigenous paintings in Indian territory or present-day Oklahoma, uh, where I'm currently working. So I'm calling in from Pahuska, Oklahoma, which is about an hour north of Tulsa, um, which is Osage Treaty Territory. Um, while I'm working with the Gilcrease Museum on a termed contract, I see my artwork and research as a curator and scholar inextricably interwoven with my experience of being a descendant, maker, and community member of my own Indigenous nations. I see myself as less of a curatorial expert or authority in the field, uh, someone who accesses funding and power of the colonial institution I work with, and more of a descendant maker and community member who happens to have education and expertise in the field of art and design, as well as museum studies. So the responsibilities I have to my ancestors, community, elders, and grandmothers remain intact. These responsibilities and accountabilities lead my life and my work. So this image uh, on the right is a ledger painting titled Women Wearing War Paraphernalia in Victory Dance, circa 1880, attributed to Julian Scott, ledger artist A. And it's currently housed in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The photo on the left is uh, digitally taken by iPhone an image of my sisters, mother, and aunt at our ceremonial Tonkonga or Kiowa Black Leggings in 2019. I want to focus on uh, these images in concert with one another as a way of providing a perspective of Indigenous time and my research on Indigenous futurism, which is an outgrowth of my lived experience as a descendant of ancestral artists, makers, singers, genealogists, war chiefs, medicine holders, and all of those that went before me. I acknowledge because of my raising, um, my experience is one of many. I'm one of dozens, hundreds, and thousands of Kiowa relatives in my maternal ancestry, my experience lives through multi-generational knowledges and wisdom. So I find this kind of juxtaposition of the ways that museums um, house recollections of ourselves um, with our own current and ongoing um, lived experience really interesting. And the Left is an image of my great grandma, Alice Porman Paddlety Toybo, um, who I'm named after. And on the right is a diagram of a Kiowa encampment by a white anthropologist named James Mooney. Um, these configurations of self and community uh, can serve as tangible images or sites of ceremony as geospatial uh, manifestations of our genealogical confluence, which holds indigenous time like a tightly bundled winter blanket. So my academic genealogies are just as important when framing indigenous futurism as research. Um, as an indigenous researcher, I'm also accountable to the men and women who have mentored me on my academic journey and with their life work inspired and formed and transformed my journey. These women and men are leaders in their own tribes and communities, some holding chief titles in and academia, um, are and uh, currently teach in positions uh, across academia. Right, so I was raised uh, knowing that because of boarding school era and the story of my ancestors, um, education has always been a very uh, sort of colonial 
institution for me. And so when I went to university in New Zealand, I had this kind of awareness and it's it's been from a very young age that when you're going to school, you know, there's a shedding that occurs or at least an invitation to shed those original teachings or instructions or knowledge systems um, as the earliest uh, examples or experiences of education for my family um, were uh, experiences of assimilation as an attempt to dominate Indigenous people. Um, so I consciously chose early on to work with those um, lecturers, professors, and even departments whose work and way of being serves Indigenous communities, or at least recognizes Indigenous communities before uh, serving the institution. So I attended Auckland University of Technology and um, had the privilege of studying with Dr. Albert Rafiti in the School of Spatial Design. Uh, Dr. Rafiti is a Samoan Indigenous architect, lecturer, and mentor. When I was an undergrad, one of the first studios I selected uh, of Dr. Fiti's was based in a lecture in the Fale Pacifica on ceremonial space. In that lecture, he said something that my mind would dwell on for years. He explained the lashing of the ceiling beams, the metaphor of the structural pillars and the allocated seating within the meeting house proper. He said the space walks us through ritual and signification titles and therefore your position or physical spot at the table are inherited. You are the latest model of your ancestors, an avatar for them. Those words deeply resonated and were a form of remembrance for me while attending university overseas, away from my maternal ancestral territories on which I was raised. These notions of indigenous spatial, architectural and physical markers uh, which we navigated between the sacred and the profane. These design principles uh, for me traveled beyond theory or sociological concept. And in fact, in my experience, they can be within or without a ring of wooden benches presenting a meshwork of physical thresholds. There's an image on the left of Tonk Konga. Uh, this is a photo taken in 2019 of uh, myself. Actually, I'm not in this image. So this is an image of my relatives from my toy bow and paddle families, as well as members of my clan who are from Redstone. Um, the seemingly empty grass clearing and the trees we occupied with benches, lawn chairs and teepees was, as my mentor said, filled with ritual and signification. The spaces, relationships between people as well as physical spaces hold the ontological framework of Tonk Konga. The ground, the distance between the seats, the, dis the distance between the drum and the arena, the distance between each other, the regalia we wore on our bodies. Tim Ingold said, it is not then that organisms are entangled in relations, rather every organism, indeed everything in itself is an entanglement, a tissue of knots whose constituent strands as they have become tied up with other strands and other bundles make up the meshwork. All of these signifiers are the emblems and residue of a life world. These signifiers in synchronicity are for the trained eye or a descendant, a manuscript of sorts and a telling of goigu or kaiwa ways. Um, so during my time in undergrad, uh, Dr. Rafiti continued to advocate for Maori and Pacific students to thrive. Uh, these images are of a work I created titled The Grandmother Project. It's a film installation of ethnographically gathered footage of Pacifica, Maori, Samoan, and Tongan, and Native American, Kiowa uh, indigenous elders. 
The project maps, interrogates, and locates frameworks of indigenous and Pacifica notions of spatial orientation, specifically in relation to lived tradition, oration, genealogy, cosmology, and the notion of va, bringing together the light and uh, stories of experts or grandmothers in whose minds are enclosed the syllables of our collective generational past. So during this uh, work, artwork, I really utilized oral histories as a methodology um, through moving image. I created soundscapes and sought to uh, to provide these immersive art installations. So this particular work was exhibited, was exhibited with Architecture and Women in 2013. Let's see. This next work, Sea of Plains, is a performative installation which navigates the narrations between Indigenous representation and social, political, and ecological climates. This hueful project exploits notions of post-colonial Indigenous primordialism, Indigenous eroticism, and speaks to the contemporary experiential confines which these colonial notions present through moving image. The project-based work engages consciousness of Indigenous representation, irrespective of place, through cropping projected film and filtering that footage onto the ground. A sea of light lighted images and their sound components creates the sea of planes. Um, So Sea of Plains was also presented at the Auckland Museum in Auckland, New Zealand. They have one of the largest Pacifica collections in the world. And during my last year of university, they called for Auckland University and Auckland University of Technology to create studios responding to ways that they might activate uh, and initiate more connections between their audiences and the, and the collections that were being displayed. Uh, Sea of Plains brought together inherent love of connections between ourselves as Indigenous people and our material culture. The work also delved into misrepresentation and archaic, frankly harmful museum norms of adhering to patrimonial ethics while displaying or educating on Indigenous people and sort of using the experiences of others in extractive or exploitative ways. Um, the politics of display, which decontextualize our ancestral objects to the point of racial stereotype or historical gaslighting. We see this in galleries who posture indigenous nations as evolutionary precursors to white enlightenment or within institutions who are committed to legacies of settler colonial history. So following this project, I decided to um, get a master's of museum and heritage practice. Uh, the Sea of Plains as an artwork critically leaned into the messages. We are not only here, but we're thriving and museums should make space for us to tell our own stories in our own ways and step into that accountability and inclusiveness. Right. So this is the late, great Teresia Teiwa. She's a uh, lecturer. She was a lecturer and uh, mentor. She worked at Victoria University of Wellington as the head of Pacific Studies. Um, she's a poet and scholar, born in Honolulu, Hawaii, to <clears throat> a Kiribati father and African-American mother raised in Fiji. Uh, she was the author of a poetry collection, Searching for Ne Ni uh, Ma Noa in 1995, and co-author of Last Virgin Island in Paradise, a one-act play in 1993. Uh, Teresia 
earned a BA of Trinity College in Washington, DC, and an MA in history from the University of Hawaii and a PhD of history of consciousness from the University of California, Santa Cruz. She taught history and politics for five years at the University of South Pacific in Suva, Fiji, before moving to New Zealand to teach Pacific studies at Victoria University of Wellington. Um, so this incredible mama, uh, academic mama, was one of the first to uh, teach me how to think about methodologies as, uh, as a, sort of step by step to bridging the gaps between indigenous knowledge systems and worldviews and institutional uh, sort of colonial practices. Um, it was in her uh, methodologies course during my master's that I learned about Gakala and Dalanoa methodologies, the value of um, creating a systematic approach to gifting, humility, reflex, reflexivity, and reciprocity. Uh, she taught indigenous feminisms and Pacifica feminisms and her passion and life work in Pacifica and oceanic studies through poetry and research gave me the courage at an important time in my life um, to reorient my, myself and my research in this way. One of my favorite quotes uh, that she shared was that we sweat and we, we cry salt water. So we know that the ocean is really in our blood. And uh, Dr. Teiwa passed in 2017 after a brief illness at the age of 48. Um, it was during this time uh, at Victoria University that I had the opportunity to um, take on several roles within partnering institutions with the university. Uh, I worked with the National Library of New Zealand uh, con and conducted visitor research at the National Museum of New Zealand, uh, designing a tailored sort of audience-based analysis of the efficacy of exhibition design. The next uh, mentor to me has been Moana Parata. So Moana is Kaitiaki Tanga from Māori. Uh, she's a collection manager at Te Papa Tongarewa. And she really uh, taught about the importance of adhering to tikanga or cultural protocol. Uh, as more than sort of following a set of strict arbitrary rules, but really um, eating, living and breathing it uh, and kind of breaking down the barriers between our roles and our, our responsibilities to our people at the home fires and our own indigenous communities and the roles that we fill within museums. Um, for example, Kaitiaki Māori, uh, don't work within the realm of the ancestors during wahine mate, wahine hapu. Um, so menstruating and pregnant women do not work with the collection um, in person and rather do desk work until that time has passed. And this kind of uh, practice, which is also um, a, a form of, of policy, really is in respect and honor to the concepts of tapu and noa or sacred and profane. Um, and this was sort of my first exposure of uh, the powerful uh, impacts of indigenous methodologies of collection management. Um, and this, this was also the first time I was introduced as artifact or object as taonga in, in a official uh, sort of way. So as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, I was my first introductions to um, my own material culture and the material culture uh, of others, this, this affected the way that I viewed the world, was really seeing these objects in use. And here at Te Papa, working with Moana, was the first time I'd seen that kind of concept enacted in a practice-based way. Um, during my time uh, with Moana, I learned a lot of Te Reo Māori, which is an indigenous language of New Zealand, the official language. 
I sat in on meetings. Um, I learned collection uh, practices that were outside my own cultural knowledge system. Um, and so I'll forever be grateful to being invited to that space. Um, one thing that I, I really respected was the implementation of indigenous languages, not just in the galleries, um, but also through the um, sort of collection processes as well as sort of registrar processes. So I had to learn the words for, uh, uh, you know, different objects in English as well as in Maori. And English was always displayed in a kind of bracket um, through uh, the information technology system, um, as well as in uh, written registrar books, which I think for me sort of spoke volumes, especially growing up in a place like Oklahoma, where I was raised, and in Indigenous uh, stories, people, and our languages were completely excluded from, you know, institutional spaces. Um, <clears throat> so that was a profound moment uh, that definitely impacted me, this experience. Another woman I had the honor of working with is Grace Hutton. She's the Pacific Collection Manager. Um, Grace is really like an auntie. I learned so much from her, including the value of relationship creation and maintenance within and outside the collection. I learned about the importance of having tea and preparing and caring for the details of Indigenous hospitality because we are made of and bound by the relationships and connections we form with not only material culture, but the descendants and relatives of the makers themselves. <clears throat> and even by the communities to which Tonga belong to. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, one thing that I loved about working with Grace is, um, you know, that again, sort of restoration of um, being able to see indigenous protocols in action in a national museum and the subtlety, um, well, I guess not even subtle, but you know, these processes that we go through with each other um, that are so often, especially in U US museums or collecting institutions within the United States, um, those, those subtle ways were not lost or sacrificed. They weren't just, they didn't have to be justified. They just sort of were enacted. And um, that was very, very impactful to me at that time. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, here in the Pacific Collection, I learned about asserting and meticulously following those protocols of, ca of care and reciprocity. So beyond the bare minimum um, that we see elsewhere. Uh, and this is another space where, you know, there is a a lot of, of light bulb moments or aha moments. But one thing that I really enjoyed about um, working in this particular collection as a Tongan woman is seeing that, uh, you know, our own um, Moanan people, Oceanic people, you know, can have and, you know, can have these positions of, um, caring for our own objects as collection managers, as curators, but also, um, you know, that we're not just sort of relegated to like cleaning staff, because I think about other experiences that I've had in the past as a child in the US and, you know, to see people of color um, in these higher positions was not normal. Um, but then not just that, not just being included, but really having, you know, really having that agency to inform their process and really having that institutional support of recognizing that there are treaties that exist between indigenous nations and folks and that indigenous knowledge ways uh, were valued and are valued in these sorts of spaces was deeply profound. So following my um, graduation from Victoria University, I moved home to the US and began an artwork called Esque Mai Women. So this is a collaborative work uh, with Ojibwe designer and architect Cheyenne Thomas. 
um, we actually met in New Zealand at an Indigenous design conference um, where we were both presenting. And so she's from Canada, I'm Kiowa and Tongan from Oklahoma and our experiences of being raised in Indian country overlapped and sparked a sort of self-led dialogue uh, that, you know, we are really interested in re um, representing ourselves and our own sort of self-led documentations of lived experiences. So Iskwe Mai Women is a living archive of indigenous women who are moving and shaking up Indian country. And I mean N-D-N, not I-N-D-I-A-N. <laughs> In this century, it's an ode, a trill, a shout of celebration for the women who exemplify resilience and strength from the millennial generation. The combination of audio and moving image, as well as photography, were used as records of these incredible women to store their voices, stories, and provide a snapshot of each matriarch sort of mid-stride. Um, and in a way, this work resisted that longstanding settler colonial norm of outsiders telling the subject stories. Um, and it's very much, uh, you know, I talk about that space between my two homes of, of Oklahoma and New Zealand a lot in my work, because there's so much um, there's so much of a distance in, in those sort of norms within the field of art and design, as well as those norms uh, within the museum field. And so um, really this project was about that kind of autonomous sort of self-led, I guess, celebration of women in our own spaces. And, you know, we know that studies have shown that, you know, institutions really do mirror the societies that they're in. And when we have norms across the nation, across the US and Canada, a missing and murdered indigenous woman. And I created this project back at a time where, you know, I was flabbergasted that no one was counting. Uh, no one was um, providing that data back then. Um, and this is right after Canada had begun their um, investigation into MMIW, MMIP, Missing and Murdered Indigenous People. But um, it was a it was a fantastic project that you know really kind of honored that collaborative process through which you know our own complex first voice stories can be told. So this is a little bit more of my work um, in recent years. This is a digital print of one of my relatives, Abiatan Woodenlance, um, which combines archival photo photography and uh, digital printmaking. Um, so my practice over time has really evolved. After moving home in 2017, I really focused on adornment and gifts and those tangible parts of our culture as uh, a form of my own personal healing, as well as um, just returning to home. So um, I just kind of wanted to show in these last few images, the value of having those stories presented from a first sort of voice perspective. So as a maker, uh, and an artist as well as a curator, the back and forth is a lot. <laughs> and um, so this is a dress that I created um, several years ago with my mom, Deborah Cocker. And um, it's a dress of elk teeth on broadcloth, uh, yellow broadcloth and check glass cut beads. And this dress is really about my genealogy about my great grandma, Alice Porman Paddle T. Toybo, as well as myself as a young woman and where I'm at. And so these images are of me wearing the dress in uh, practice in its place, in the place that it, this dress belongs. Um, so on the right is an image of myself and Deva Daylight. We were at a photo shoot for a Stephen Paul Judd 
print that he was making. Um, and on the left is myself, my sister cousin, Bethany Dewpoint and her son and my mom. So when we see these dresses in collection, what we're seeing is something that was created by specific people, women, uh, for specific women. And every part of that dress is made in uh, a very specific way to tell the stories of a woman's journey or genealogy. And I wanted to share these examples of my own artwork um, as well as me actually wearing them just to kind of show what we're looking at when we look at collections. So again, I just kind of going back to my my first experiences of museums, I always thought it was interesting that, you know, a museum would take somebody's moccasins or take somebody's shawl or somebody's blanket and just kind of like lay it out flat and just put it up against, you know, behind glass. And maybe there'd be like a little panel about the nation that it was from, or maybe they wouldn't know who the artist was, but there's so much story and narrative that was excluded from that. And that was always something that took me back. And so here's the kind of inverse of that, where we have this relationship, which is very much alive. So the last thing I wanna kind of talk about today is, um, is a really exciting uh, sort of, tangent on my research that I've been able to partake in um, with the Gilcrease Museum where I work. So as I mentioned, I work with, my research is really focused on 2D Indigenous paintings and that kind of collection-based research. But the Gilcrease has always been on my, um, <clears throat> on my radar because they house so many of my ancestors' objects, including this red wool cradle board by uh, my ancestor Bai Gigop. So Bai Gigop's mother was Kintaro, which means dragonfly woman. And she is a very beloved, very integral part of um, Kiowa history. And so I descend from her younger daughter, um, Padotai. And um, any time I was in Tulsa, I would always think about that cradle board that's in the Gilcrease. And so before ever working there, um, at, you know, this place was on my radar as the home to this, to this beautiful family heirloom. And um, my aunt, Anisha, Vanessa, by Gigop Jennings, she is um, a, a Mopope descendant. So by Gigop's husband, Mopope, that became their last name. And um, she uh, and I have worked together over the last year or so to really pull from this, um, this collective knowledge, collective memory that we share um, and, you know, begin to tell the stories of this cradle from our own perspectives. Um, so, so one thing that's always kind of fascinated me um, as a descendant and uh, as an artist and a researcher is, is to see again, these objects decontextualized and sort of stripped away um, from their use. So this particular cradle board um, was on display in a gallery called Enduring Spirit, which um, was a sort of long-term exhibition. And uh, it, the label was very brief and it was sort of in a case with um, saddlebags, beaded saddlebags and, you know, several other items that didn't really fit within the narrative or the use um, or, or the, uh, the power of this object. Um, so, so that was really sort of interesting, but um, to kind of go through uh, a little bit of the research that I've done. Um, so one thing that I was particularly interested during this research um, of, of something that's so important and so, um, so intimately connected to myself um, is that idea of thinking about our objects, right? This cradle board as a technology, as a device that is useful. And I think that's something that we don't, I mean, I've never in my life actually seen um, a, 
uh, exhibition or, um, you know, there's been one publication, one book uh, that has sort of scraped the surface of it, but really looked at these cradle boards, Kiowa cradle boards as a form of technology, as something that's useful and helpful to children. And as something that um, can teach the world uh, about design, about sustainable design, about design that is centered around care and uh, genealogical ways of knowing and doing. So that's something that I really brought to the fore of this research was focusing on how to tell that story in a way that provides um, my kinfolk, my community, and all of the women who created these cradle boards with um, dignity, as well as with a voice in, in what it is that we're looking at. So, Part of that research uh, included looking into the medical benefits of um, using a cradle board, of putting your baby into a cradle board. Um, and, you know, what what does that actually do? And I think, you know, the reasons that behind that uh, knowledge not being very readily available, I think, are definitely connected to the way Indigenous people are viewed, especially through museum contexts, as the sort of, as I said earlier, evolutionary precursors to invention, to technology, to advance, uh, intellectual advance. Um, and those sort of um, racist, frankly, and dated ideologies really have limited um, the public's ability and to an extent as a descendant, our own community's ability to access our own histories in a way that's dignified or even accurate. So thinking of this cradle board as a form of technology um, was a kind of uh, first step towards um, writing this short article which has been developed into a browse. So if you want to read that full text, uh, you can go ahead and search Goi Gu Cradle Boards, Legacies of Love and Resilience. It'll be in the Gilcrease Museum's collections online. Um, but but right, really thinking about this, this cradle board as something that was made by specific women, by Gagope and likely her mother Keen Toddle and sister Parotai. Um, for a specific person, for her child, for her grandchildren. Um, and, and, you know, the implementation of this postnatal care device, you know, does have these benefits that um, help the baby to grow, help their sort of um, proprioceptive system, you know, when we're thinking about balancing or spatial orientation, um, all of these systems are developed within the first year of the baby being born. And this cradle really stimulates that growth in a good way and also provides protection. So there's so many different layers um, to this cradle board that um, really weren't being represented, not only in the gallery that it was displayed in, but um, in texts anywhere else. And so it was, it has been one of my greatest joys and one of my greatest honors to be able to research um, this particular cradle board with my um, aunt Vanessa by Gagob Jennings. And in the end, I wanna share just as a, a way of closing um, a reflection that I wrote in February, 2021, as I prepared for spring and the COVID-19 vaccinations became available in Oklahoma. And uh, this is through tribal nations clinics uh, connected to IHS. Um, and in a way it's kind of like uh, an offering that I have to what I've shared today, um, but it's called Bloom. And I'll just read that. I hope their bodies recover from the decades of racist abuse. I hope their minds recover from the trauma of needs unmet. I hope their spirits recover from the dreams never realized. I hope their emotions recover from normalized self-betrayal. I hope their children recover from this too. I hope their cousins, uncles, and aunts recover. I hope their whole camp recovers. I hope their whole lineage recovers. I hope their whole extended family recovers. I hope their whole nation recovers. I hope the sky, I hope the earth they reside on recovers. I hope the toxic polluted waters recover. I hope the plants and animals around them recover. I hope for healing for them beyond this virus. 
I hope everything that fell out of balance returns into balance. I hope they bloom fresh green sprouts from beneath the ash of change. I hope their roots and veins grow thick and strong as cedar. May they bloom, may they bloom, may they bloom. Thank you, Obaha. And Kara, that was a really great presentation. And I think it really just uh, sort of, you know, tip of the iceberg in terms of the breadth of work um, that you're doing, uh, you know, with institutions and as artists. Um, but I think it really touches upon what the, you know, sort of overall theme of this conversation is, which is, you know, reclaiming these narratives, which, um, uh we've sort of um well not sort of but that we've lost uh, due to um you know being a part of this colonial project um and, and it's sort of long lasting legacy and effects uh, within and among our people um uh to that extent um i just like to remind everyone that's in the audience um to please feel free to uh contribute any questions or comments you might have uh, to the um, Q&A uh, portion, um, and we'll happy, happily address those um, uh, now, actually. Uh, so to begin, I mean, one of the things that I'm curious about and, and a topic that we've sort of touched upon in the uh, uh, previous conversations today is I'm, I'm curious to hear about um, your thoughts on uh, best practices. Um, so for example, um, especially for, for you, Kara, I think that this is, is something that I'm curious about in your process. Um, are there people, objects, scenes that should not be captured or circulated? And, and how do you as a Native person sort of navigate, you know, these types of um, uh, issues and and I understand, of course, with each native nation that it sort of rules, if you will, differ among different tribes. And so I'm just curious, like, what, how are you able to um, sort of navigate through that process? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I guess I'd like to just kind of go back to the beginning of my practice, because when I started, I was at the University of Houston and um, like I said, I really knew that I wanted um, I wanted to be a photographer when I came uh, to the Institute of American Indian Arts, and I wanted to be a photojournalist and a photo documentarian. And when I came to IAI, um, the genre of Native photography, it really felt like it had been defined. And for me, it felt like it was still defined in the late 90s by Curtis, you know. And so really, when I'm honest and I take a look at my really early photographs, um, we were working in black and white film. I was asking my friends, I think all of us were asking our friends, you know, like, um, can you wear your regalia? Will you go stand outside? Can we find a place that's completely devoid of anything modern? And uh, there was like really kind of this like time of disillusionment is what I would say, where I either thought I was boring or my ideas were boring. And it really took um, like becoming more mature and understanding like haha ha, we don't even do that right you know so um why are we perpetuating this stereotype through our own photography now that you know we have access to this medium and um I think it's fair to say that when I was young um I set out and I was like every kid photographer like I really want to be a national geographic photographer and then you become more educated and you're like, oh my gosh, that's one of the most exploitive periodicals in the world. And, you know, so there's another disillusioning moment. And I, you know, I really had to work through all of those. Like, do I give up or do I give up on this medium or do I continue to find 
um, how to take this medium that has been a weapon towards our communities and do something good with that. Is that possible? And um, so from a very early, you know, point in, in learning the medium, that was like central, like how, um, how can we how can we use this to counter stereotypical narratives? Um, how can we never use this to take from our community again? How can we never ask somebody to photograph something that's culturally private? How can I never share something that maybe somebody has asked me to photograph that's sacred? Um, like, how can I make sure that I'm a protector of their cultural privacy and their intellectual property? And I do that. You know, that's something that I do as a photographer and, um, you know, trust is something that's so important, you know, um, within our communities. And uh, I think you have to honor that. Um, I think you have to honor um, people's trust and, 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 and always keep that central to, to how you're moving forward in this world. Thank you so much for your words. Um, there are a few questions from the audience. Um, this one's for Mario Caro, which reads, your imagery is sublime, both in terms of your themes, but also technically. Could you share some of the technical issues that you've been engaging recently? For example, your lighting is amazing, particularly outdoors. Are there challenges when you scale up to billboard size? I'm wondering about the limits imposed by these formal and technical aspects of your practice and the demands of mastering the medium of photography. Um, so that's a great question. Uh, I, at some point, probably about 10 years ago, um, kind of like honed in on what it was that I wanted to make. And that was these large scale photographs because I felt like the size of the photograph um, was as interesting as the content. And that kind of correlated with um, understanding that my strength as a photographer was other humans and this inner, this um, inter, connectedness that I had um, to be able to tell people stories and you know it began to feel like a strength and like a gift and um, most certainly the formal training in film uh, was you know predates digital and that meant that as we trained in the medium of film everything had to be done in camera um, and so I was trained in medium format and large format where there was not an error for margin and exposure and, you know, everything had to be done in camera. And so photo illustration really for me became um, a tool to uh, photo illustrate and approach the photographs and even kind of more of a painterly. So I would have these ideas that were almost like paintings and I would do, I, I do as much of them as I can in camera. And then photo illustration becomes a tool then to like um, layer the story, whether it be like supernatural in everyday life or, you know, a little bit of something that takes it otherworldly. Um, but the resolute, so, you know, film, it used to be the larger format film, the higher, the bigger, um, uh, final image that you could make. And now with photography, it's the higher resolution of a camera um, and interpolating pixels uh, is kind of like the language that we use now. Um, but really uh, it all goes back to that formal film training of everything having to be done in camera. So you can't um, fool the human eye for proper exposure. And that's just, um, lots of years of learning to balance light and drag shutters and um, failures and successes. And I shoot a lot and I practice before um, often the people that I'm collaborating with even get there. And sometimes I give it two days um, to make sure, you know, that I, um, I'm not wasting anybody's time, you know, because people... Um, invest their own time in these productions and I want them to be a really good experience. So I would say that there's a lot of practice. I think what's really interesting that I didn't learn until I took it to billboard size is um, 
like what I produce for the museums and for the in-person um, institutions, those really large photographs that are sometimes like five, six feet, sometimes 13 feet. Um, they're so wonderful as humans to engage with the humans that are in them, right? Because they feel so lifelike. So that's one experience of photographs, but when they're on the billboards, um, I, it really surprised me that they get farmed out to these digital printing companies that print on, you know, like kind of a plasticky vinyl. And then like, that's what's wrapped around the billboard. And they actually want not that high resolution of file. Um, and I guess what happens is like from that viewing distance, um, your, your eye just kind of want to puts all wants to put all of the information back together. Um, so taking it to billboard size is actually not as hard as taking it to the large sizes that you see in the museums with the you know super high resolution. I hope that answers your question. Um, I do without getting into like the the Hasselblad and the medium format digital that's like kind of out of my price range. Um, I do have a really high resolution camera and I'm not the most technical photographer. So I kind of at some point I would say I'm a photographer that like, if that's all you're worried about, then you're not focusing on, you know, making the art that you can do so much with even a 35 millimeter camera, um, as far as like content and story. Thank you so much for that. Um, there's another question about your work. Um, the repetition of a divine feminine aspect in your photography is very intriguing as it transcends generational contexts. In addition, thank you for your perspective on cultural privacy. How do you see the futurism of your work when woven into a durable narrative of North America? Um, this is one of those questions um, that I have been so fascinated by you know being a photographer and following my heart and you know being on this journey of trying to um be a good person and give back to my community that sometimes people teach me about my artwork um but i would say this idea of engaging futurism for me is something that you know we're having a lot of dialogue about right now and um for me, indigenous futurism, I think as I'm learning, um, as I'm learning about it becomes really um, normalizing our present. So kind of like more this idea of indigenous futurism is taking control of our now and um, securing like equitable living right now and equitable visibility right now that we don't need to go um, too far into the future with, and we're not going to be able to go too far into the future unless we focus on where we're at right now. Um, and so I hope that that kind of uh, answers that question um, that I don't think that there is a sustainable future without focusing on the present. Thank you. I think this question is probably for both of you. Could you speak to your experiences working with institutions and galleries? Can you repeat the question? Could you speak to your experiences working with institutions and galleries? Do you want to go first, Jordan? <laughs> sure. I was sort of patiently waiting for you to go. Um, I think um, working with institutions, both as an artist and working as a curatorial scholar, the experience is quite different. Um, I feel something that I've learned over the years um, is really the value and the importance of collaborating with because that's what we do when we work with people, we're collaborating with them. Um, folks who have a really good understanding of colonial histories about their institution in the context of um, the colonial timeline that we're on. And, um, and also has sort of clear articulate practices about, um, or at least views on how to kind of 
address projects in relation to that history. Um, so for me, that's something that's really important when thinking about working with institutions is um, asking the questions of how have these relationships um, with the museum in particular, um, that institutional history, um, what's the storyline there and how has the museum begun to address those histories and all their complexity and um, how is this project, whatever the project is, contributing to that timeline in a good way? I think I would like to answer this question um, for any of the young artists out there um, that are curious to know about how to get into institutions or galleries that um, at some point, I gave up on industry standards as a young native photographer, and I decided that it was far more important to make the work, um, that it really took the industry standards to catch up to what we were doing as young native artists and as digital artists. There really wasn't a place for us in the shows. Um, there really wasn't a place for us in the institutions. And so I think for young people, it's really important to make sure um, that they're going all the way through their creative process and staying really true um, to their story. And in my experience, um, like making um, the best art that you can possibly make that's you know, got the most content, that has narrative, that gives back to your people, that uplifts your community is really um, where to center yourself and your process of creation and that the institutions and galleries will catch up um, just the way that they do with our indigenous science and, and that sort of thing. So I would say just um, to your own self be true and um, that institutions um, are not always, I, I don't, think that there's, uh, they're all very different from my experience. I think, um, I, I think museums think that there's like an industry standard, but I would say as an artist that um, has now been collected by, you know, probably, you know, 40 different institutions that they're all very different. Like every registrar is different. Every archival practice is different. Um, how they want the photographs collected, the shipping methods, um, they're all like incredibly different. Uh, so I, again, just go back to concentrate on being a great artist and um, the rest will follow. I have a quick question. Um, for Jordan, um, I am a huge fan of your academic experience and, um, you know, having studied in New Zealand and um, working with several of the people that you mentioned in your presentation, who I think are uh, really sort of spearheading this movement, um, which this entire conversation and symposium is based upon, right? Um, and I'm curious to know, like, uh, I always feel personally that New Zealand is miles ahead in terms of, uh, you know, uh, um, sort of pushing the envelope and um, uh, moving in these directions of reclaiming um, our material culture and our voices um, in, in these uh, settings. And so I'm just curious if you could just share a little bit about, you know, some of the differences um, that you see having worked here in the United States currently and also the work that you've done um, in New Zealand and perhaps maybe some ways that, or, that uh, institutions like Harvard could look at in terms of integrating, um, whether that be through scholarly work or through, um, uh, you know, auditing or reevaluating museum practices at Harvard. Um, I'm just really curious to see what your perspectives might be on kind of these comparisons. Thank you for that question, Heidi. Um, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, the museum field really mimics society. And so um, the context around um, the indigenous museum field are very different in that country. Um, there are completely different legal and structural perspectives of the treaties 
Um, there's reparations being paid through the British crown currently. So, you know, all of these different contexts, socially, politically, um, economically are the backdrop, right, for, for a lot of this institutional shift uh, and these sort of decolonial practices that have been in place um, and developing and building over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, but in, in terms of that juxtaposition, I think for me, there's something very inspiring about having that sort of transnational uh, indigenous experience and identity because I don't have to wonder whether decolonizing museums is possible because I've seen different formats and I've seen different approaches to just that. Um, and maybe they didn't at the time label what they were doing as decolonizing museum um, practices. But yeah, I think that for me, that's something that's very inspiring is to know that there are these examples, um, albeit in other countries, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, um, of museum practices and policies and protocols that um, contribute to community healing um, rather than perpetuating these sort of colonial violent norms within the field um, or within the field's history. Um, so definitely as a source of inspiration and then also, uh, you know, as a practitioner myself, I think just to kind of echo what Kara had touched upon in her last answer, really doubling down on my own sort of approach and um, refining my own curatorial practice um, is is important um, as as a scholar and also as a person who has to walk within these sort of contexts of colonial institutions in my own community. So having those boundaries, you could think of them as boundaries um, in place of, you know, not speaking for people, not tokenizing people, making sure there's money or funding and grant projects to give reciprocity, provide reciprocity to communities and not just monetary, but also spiritual sustenance. Like what are the gifts that we're giving back when we ask somebody to give us information? Um, following those protocols for me is really critical as I sort of navigate these spaces as someone who's a community member and a descendant, as well as someone who happens to have degrees in this field. Thank you, Jordan. Um, another question specifically for you and, and also uh, Kara, I think you can chime in, in here too, but um, Jordan, do you have any upcoming exhibitions you'll be curating in the near future? And I guess like um, to build upon that, uh, Kara, if you would um, just share a bit about the work um, that you're currently working on and uh, maybe some projects that are, that are happening. Thanks. At the moment, um, I am not curating an exhibition. I'm very deep into the research. Um, uh, where I work with the Gilcrease Museum. Um, and in my own practice, as I mentioned in the presentation, I have been really focused on creating artworks and regalia pieces that are worn in community for community. Um, so I am currently working on some little moccasins for my niece who was born in 2020, so the big year. Um, and uh, they have little oak leaves um, but right now, focusing on that research, and um, I am really looking forward to the different projects that are um, going on, though, around the country. Um, as I uh, mentioned at the beginning, I'm currently living and working in the Los Angeles area. I'm working on a project that was seeded by the Indian Collective through the Radical Imagination Grant to bring visibility to First Peoples of Los Angeles and greater Southern California. Um, so as part of that process, um, it really is informed by everything that we're talking about here um, today. Uh, I shared a few, couple of pieces that I've worked on, um, but I'm in deep interview and free prior and informed consent with the Tongva community. Um, and with other communities, making sure that there's um, inclusion in uh, public art that goes up um, in Los Angeles. And that's been uh, an incredibly 
beautiful process where I've learned so much um, about the First Peoples and the struggles that they're going through here in Los Angeles. And I hope to create pieces um, that give back to their community. They'll go up in August. So I have about seven weeks and um, a big uh, production schedule over the next seven weeks with the local community um, and creating those uh, pieces for public art um, that will go up in August. So that's what I'm working on. We have one more question from the audience. Um, and I think this, I'm really interested to know both your perspectives on it. Are there ways and sites for archiving knowledge within the community where privacy is maintained and protected for future generations? What is the role of oral history in an artist's practice? Um, could you just ask that first part of the question again, Divya? Are there ways and sites for archiving knowledge within the community where privacy is maintained and protected for future generations? Mm -hmm. For archiving knowledge, absolutely. I think, you know, there's um, one of the sort of misconceptions in the field is that uh, indigenous folks or indigenous communities don't have their own ways of storing housing and caring for um, ancestral objects um, and contemporary objects, which is not true. Um, so a, a lot of uh, what I've been looking into with my research at the Gilcrease um, focuses on narrative paintings. How did this graphic style of painting and figurative painting that's transformed through time um, house oral histories, house human experience, house that autobiographical uh, lens or perspective or recollection of ourselves and how is that information transmitted to others. Um, so uh, as a Kiowa person, a really good example of that is um, through our TV paintings. Um, so figurative works on canvas or hide, uh, you know, uh, the maker or the creator oftentimes a man in a sort of storyboarded way and if you wanted to look at it like that is um, this sort of graphic visual language a telling and the other half of that is a really important oral history or narrative that could either be a song um, or a long story or a series of both wherein you know a group of people are invited to remember this history together um, so so I think you know there's that culmination of our own artistic practices, which have existed, you know, since time immemorial. I actually just saw something online about some petroglyphs being um, desecrated uh, by people who wanted to hike and they were like bolting into these petroglyphs, you know. So, so these representations of ourselves and histories have been recorded since time immemorial. And, um, you know, part of the, the, um, the benefit, I guess you could say, about, of hiring Indigenous folks, Indigenous scholars with these source community experiences is that perhaps, you know, folks can re-hear uh, or relearn those histories in a way that connects those in-community practices and norms um, to a broader audience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question too. I think I can um, respond to it from my own community at Chimwavy Valley, um, which we do have a cultural center. Um, and I was formerly the director of our cultural center in charge of the archives. I think on one hand, um, one of the first person experiences that I had was that it was definitely an area where we needed funding. Um, to create archival systems. And that was like both twofold for objects, um, creating um, knowledge around um, how to archive and handle properly some of the pieces, 
Um, but uh, one of the things stepping into that role that I really wanted to do was examine our ways of um, our relationship to archives um, for photography. And uh, as you know, a newly graduated photography student, um, there was all of this photography that you know we saw in textbooks, all of these Curtis photographs. Um, but then there was what I called the lost decades. And the lost decades for me were really um, like the shoebox of photos and the suitcases of photos that I knew existed um, with e within each of the family homes. And um, I put a call out to the community um, that I, I simply asked, like, if you have photographs from, you know, around 1910 all the way up to the 1990s when I was there, if you would like to come down to the cultural center and I'll use my expertise in scanning those photos, they'll become part of the tribe's digital archives and um, just, of course, culturally private. So we can, we have the ability to share those from within the community, but they're not public to the outside. Um, but what we were also able to do was to create copies for other family members, right? So creating kind of this like archive services for these incredible photographs out of, you know, boarding school era um, photographs that it didn't exist anywhere else because we were, you know, in the 40s and 50s completely erased um, from media, from pop culture. Um, and so they became these like tread, you know, our archives became, you know, kind of like these treasures. And we were able to see for the first time many of our uncles that we had never seen pictures of when they were 18, 19 years old. So that's just like kind of one um, good story that I have that I think speaks to the question, but I will just go back and say that a lot of the cultural centers and museums um, that I've experienced with uh, that I have experience with um, definitely need help with funding. Um, you know, things like display archival display cases are tremendously expensive, um, fireproof, you know, acid free, all of these things um, are something that I think tribes would be um, like be able to bring more objects and items back home if they had um, the archival methods to be able to care for them. And um, that would be something that I would say that museums could share their knowledge with these smaller like tribal cultural centers and museums. Um, the only one at the time that I knew of what that was doing that work was the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And so we were able to receive a grant through them to create um, what was called the Summa Archives, um, um, that which is remembered archives. Um, for our tribe. And uh, I hope that answers a little bit of that question. No, definitely. I think it, the both of you um, addressed the question really clearly. And um, I just want to say thank you uh, to the both of you for participating in this panel discussion and for sharing uh, just a, a, a bit of what is like this tremendous body of work, uh, which is incredibly important for all of our, all, all of humanity quite frankly, uh, specifically also for um, indigenous people. And um, so I'm really excited about the work that you're doing in the larger uh, arena, art world and the world in, in general. And I'm completely grateful for your time and perspective that you've shared here today. Um, and uh, Divya, I don't know if you want to mention anything. Um, just thank you so much for sharing your work, both of you. Um, it's been really inspiring to learn about and I'm going to think about it a lot and kind of take it with me. So thank you so much for that. So with that said, um, this concludes our symposium today. Uh, I feel like I have a small taste of uh, Jerry Lewis's telethon that he used to do for probably like a lot of young kids don't know what that is, but <laughs> uh, I have a little taste of what that might have felt like, and, but completely uh, grateful for all of the perspectives and conversations shared here today. So um, as I mentioned earlier, all of these conversations will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, the Harvard Indigenous Design Collective. So please uh, subscribe so that you'll receive an update as to when that happens. And um, definitely join our mailing list to stay informed about the publication, which is set to come out at the end of May, if not early uh, June. 
So thank you all so much. Have a great evening and uh, I'll see you all later. Thank you.